What are you looking at? Don't tell me you've never seen a crab before. Oh, okay. You're not looking at me. You're looking at my back. So, what's wrong with it, huh? Oh, this. Well, let me tell you something, my friend. This is no tattoo. This happens to be a sacred sign. You see, I belong to that very special species of crab found in the islands of the Malukas. That's in Indonesia, in case you don't know. They pay a lot to hook somebody like me. 500 rupees, sir. This cross was a gift from a gentleman who came here centuries and centuries ago. He traveled around this area for only a couple of years, but he changed the lives of so many people. Hey, you really want to hear how I got this cross on my back? I know people say it's an old wives' tale, or more like a fisher wives' tale. <laughs> But I happen to believe it's true. You see, once upon a time, there was this priest. And then... Hey, I'm getting ahead of my story. Why don't I tell you everything from the very beginning? About 500 years ago, there was this little boy who grew up in a castle in northern Spain. His name was Francis Xavier. In those days in Europe, you had to be rich to have your own castle to run around in. And Francis' family certainly was. When he was very young, his father and brother left to go to war against an enemy kingdom. Little Francis was left with his prayer and study books. But his father was killed in battle. And as a result, the family went through bad times. The experience affected Francis deeply. And he swore never to become a warrior, a knight, like his father. Instead, he wanted to make something else of himself, so that he could restore his family's lost honor. That meant studying in a big university. When he was 19, Francis left Spain and traveled to Paris. It was to be the first of his many journeys. Ah, Paris, oui, oui, c'est la vie, mon chéri. In Francis Xavier's time, Paris was, and still is, one of the greatest centers of learning and culture in Le Monde Westel. Young people from all over the world met here to exchange ideas and to take their first brave steps into the new world. Francis enrolled at the University of Paris. He spent some of his time studying and the rest enjoying the city nightlife. There, he also played the role of an aristocrat. Francis had his own servant, although he never had enough money. In Paris, Francis found himself sharing a room with two special people. Peter Favre, a very holy man, and later, a fellow Spaniard by the name of Ignatius Loyola. Francis and Ignatius Loyola didn't get along very well. Their families were enemies in the war, where Francis' father was killed. Ignatius found Francis' lifestyle too fancy. Francis, on the other hand, found Ignatius too pious. But in spite of their differences, Francis admired Ignatius for his generosity. Little by little, their friendship grew stronger. Ignatius taught his friend how to pray, to be disciplined, and to make sacrifices. Ignatius became a teacher to Francis. Ignatius helped Francis nurture a deeper relationship with God. It wasn't easy. Ignatius referred to his student as the lumpiest dough he has worked with. Once, during a retreat, Francis got so bored with the silence that he had to tie himself up with ropes. Finally, four years after they met, Savior Ignatius, Peter Favre, and four others gathered together in a little chapel across a hill to take their vows. They promised to live holy lives, serve God and the people. They called themselves the Companions of Jesus. Ignatius and the other Companions wanted to work in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land. But a war was going on there at the time. Instead, they went to Rome to visit the Pope and to ask for his advice. 
Uh, Mr. Pope? Uh, Mr. Mr. Pope? Most people go to Rome to see the Pope because they want to ask for prayers and favors. Or they join the package tour because they want their picture taken with His Holiness. Looking at all the nice statues and churches isn't so bad either. Isn't that a Michelangelo? The Pope at that time, Paul III, told them to stay in Italy, where there was a lot of work to do. With that advice, Ignatius and his fellow priests decided to form a new religious order, the Jesuits. Francis and Ignatius also swore that they would accept any mission that the Pope would give them, even if that meant leaving the cosmopolitan cities of Europe for distant and strange lands. Shortly after, the King of Portugal asked Ignatius to send two Jesuits to their new colony in India. The king wanted to convert the rest of the world to Christianity. At the last minute, one of the priests fell ill, and Francis had to take his place. As he said goodbye to Ignatius and his fellow brothers, Francis thought of the dangers that awaited him. He knew half of all travelers on sea voyages never made it. And if he did survive, he would probably never see Europe or his friends again. He begged Ignatius to send him long letters so that it would take him a long time to read them. It was only through his letters, he told his friend, that they would ever see each other again in his lifetime. There was no such thing as jet speed travel in those days. People spent months and even years to get to their destination. From Rome, Francis rode a horse to get to Lisbon in Portugal. When he finally got on a ship to take him to Asia, he became seasick and was even stranded for several months off the coast of Africa. Finally, after more than a year, he reached Goa in southern India. Ah, India! One of the most exotic, mysterious places in the Orient. Land of snake charmers and brightly colored saris. It also was, in Francis's time, as it remains today, one of the poorest places in the world. Francis's first task was to convert the Paravas. The Paravas belonged to the lowest class in Indian society. They were called the untouchables. Their fellow Indians did not want to have anything to do with them. Francis would walk through their villages ringing a bell to signal to them that he had arrived and classes were about to begin. He won the local folk over with his open spirit and his music. He would set the prayers and the catechism lessons to song so that they would be easier to remember. Pretty soon, even the fishermen could be heard singing Christian songs. Children, in particular, were among his most loyal disciples. He taught them the Apostles' Creed and told them to recite it inside people's homes. This way, he said, people learned about Christ inside their huts and on the streets. But Savior was often at odds with his fellow Europeans in India. He did not like the way the Portuguese officials treated the natives. They were not concerned about the Indians' welfare. The Portuguese, as a sculpture from that time shows, preferred to put the Indians down, to keep them in their place. It was only Francis who dreamed of lifting them up and helping them improve their lives. Francis was so angry with the Portuguese in India that he decided to leave and to travel to Malacca, which today, geography lesson kids, is part of Malaysia. At the waterfront, he was welcomed by both the Portuguese and the native Malays who had heard about the great things he had done in India. In Malacca, Francis was often invited to dinners and other celebrations. He was the life of the party. Because of his sunny personality, People called him Alegre, the cheerful one. He always made it a point to praise his hosts on the meal and to ask who cooked it. This way, everyone easily felt at home with him. He also became friends with the lower classes of colonial society, like the seamen who spent their time drinking and gambling. Sometimes he would even join in. He'd tell them, you're seamen. No reason why you should live like monks. To have a good time without offending God is better than fighting. Despite his being treated as a VIP, that's very important priest to you, <laughs> Francis lived the same simple life that he had in India. Inside his hut was just a table, crucifix, and prayer book. He didn't like sleeping on his bed, 
preferring instead to sleep on the floor with a rock as his pillow. In Malacca, Francis was successful and happy. He had many friends, but he also knew there were other, more remote places waiting for him. Shortly afterwards, he left for the Moluccas, the Spice Islands, my hometown. And now, we get to the really interesting part of the story, because you'll find out how I got... ta -da! This. The Spice Islands were a great source of wealth for the Portuguese. All kinds of spices, from cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, pepper, were planted there. You can still get them in the local market today. You can also find a type of crab found only in the islands. The St. Francis Crab. Ask any fisherman, any villager, and he'll tell you why we, crabs, have this cross on our shelves. One day, when St. Francis was traveling to one of the islands of the Moluccas, called Ambon, a great storm broke out. Francis prayed and prayed, but because of the violent waves, his cross fell into the water. Later, after the storm died down and Francis reached land, he went to the beach feeling bad because he had brought only one cross and he had lost it. Lo and behold, he saw a crab carrying a cross, his cross. From that time on, fishermen would find some crabs with mysterious crosses on their backs. The resemblance is startling, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, that wasn't really me. That was my great, great, great grandfather. <clears throat> but then, let's move on with our story. In the Moluccas, each island that Francis visited was more distant and more dangerous than the one before. One particular island was said to be inhabited by a savage tribe. Francis's friends worried for his safety and told him not to go. But once again, he put his trust in God and left for the island. He lived with the tribesmen for several months and became very good friends with them. In fact, when the time came for him to leave, Francis decided to go secretly at night to avoid any sad goodbyes. But his friends still managed to see him off. By this time, Francis had been traveling around Asia for several years. With each place he visited, he made a new set of friends, only to leave them for another group in another village, in another island. His life was a series of welcomes and goodbyes. But the more he gave, the more he received in return. Still, he missed Ignatius and his fellow brothers in Europe. He would read their letters all the time. Then, he would cut out their signatures and put them in his necklace, together with his vows. That way, he said, he would always remember them. His next mission would be one of the most difficult in his life. After leaving the Moluccas, Francis returned briefly to Goa and then left again for Japan. He arrived in a town called Kagoshima, on the southern island of Kyushu. With him were Yajiro, a Japanese he met in Malacca, and a Spanish Jesuit named Juan Fernandez. There is even a monument to their arrival in Japan, showing Francis being carried on the back of Yajiro. In Japan, Francis had a harder time winning over converts than in his earlier trips. He was terrible with the language. It took him 40 days just to recite the Ten Commandments in Japanese. Still, with the help of Yajiro and Brother Fernandez, who spoke better Japanese, Francis began preaching to the citizens of Kagoshima. One of his converts was a young man by the name of Bernardo. He later became Francis's constant companion and one of the first Japanese Jesuits. Francis also developed a close friendship with a Zen Buddhist monk. They often met to discuss their views on religion. Francis wanted to go north, to Miyako. He thought the emperor lived there. He wanted to ask for his permission to preach. Together with Bernardo and Brother Fernandez, Francis set out on the long journey. For days and days, they walked through mountains and valleys covered with snow. They hardly had any protection against the severe cold. Francis's feet became so bruised and swollen that at one point, he had to remove his shoes and continue the journey barefoot. Francis never stopped, even when his feet began to bleed. Sadly, the emperor of Japan they were about to meet in Miyako turned out to be a powerless warlord. They couldn't even see him 
because they were too poor to pay the fee he demanded. They tried their luck again by paying their respects to the ruler of the province of Yamaguchi. This time, to their great joy, the official gave them his permission. Soon after, Francis was able to baptize a nobleman and 500 other citizens of Yamaguchi. He was also able to convert a half-blind street musician who he later named Lorenzo. After he left Japan, the authorities began their persecution of Christians. In Nagasaki, Christians were hung on crosses and executed. The situation was similar in nearby China. The Emperor of China forbade all contact with foreigners. Anyone caught breaking that law was imprisoned and put to death. But Francis wanted to enter, no matter what it took. He believed that if he converted China to Christianity, the rest of Asia would follow. Together with a Chinese merchant from Malacca named Antonio, he arrived in Sanshan, an island off the southern coast of China. There, he met a man from the city of Guangdong. The man agreed to smuggle Francis into the city to meet with the governor. Francis paid him a small fortune, and the man promised to return as soon as he could. Francis waited and waited, but the man never came back. Francis developed a high fever and became bedridden as the days passed. His health got worse, but he never gave up his dream of entering China. Soon after, with only Antonio by his side, he died without realizing his dream. I, I know what you guys are thinking. He didn't live to enter China. He didn't live to see his friends. He died a poor, heartbroken man. And worse, all alone in a faraway place where he couldn't even speak the language. Where's the glory in all that? But when you really think about it, here was a man who traveled great distances, moving from one place to the next, meeting strangers, simply because he wanted to help others find God. The only things he could share were prayers, jokes, gestures of kindness. He lived a very ordinary life, but people he met thought he was very special, and whatever goodness he did was never forgotten, years and years and years after he died. Francis Xavier was made a saint on March 12, 1622, 70 years after his death, along with his friend Ignatius of Loyola, and so his dream became a reality only after his death. In Goa, in India, where most people are Hindu, almost everyone knows about Saint Francis Xavier because he supported the Indians against the colonizers, even non-Christians love him. They regard him as some kind of national hero. His body is preserved inside the basilica in Goa, and on his feast day, the town's streets are filled with admirers. On the other side of the world, in a Jesuit church in Rome, the city where Francis and Ignatius Loyola founded the Order of the Jesuits, you can still see his right arm. It is the same right arm that traveled across continents, blessing and baptizing people. Today, when you look at it, it feels like it is still blessing you. In Japan, where the Christian church suffered very deeply, what Savior planted continues to grow strong with the Japanese Christians. And every year, in that castle in Spain where he was born, mostly young people gather for what they call the Javierada. It is the pilgrimage to remember the journey of Saint Francis. Like Francis, the pilgrims bring very little with them and share whatever they have with others. So you see, this isn't so bad after all. In fact, it's pretty cool. Every time I look at it, I remember a great man and his great dream of helping people find God. But you know what? You don't need this thing on your back to be like St. Francis. As long as you dream of helping others find God, and you work at it, then you can be like him. So, it's your turn to do what St. Francis Xavier did in your own small way. And while you're at it, why don't you throw in a little smile? Pretty soon, you'll have a cross to wear too. No, not on your back. 
but in your heart. Call